Great. Today we're pleased to have Nancy Lewis as our speaker, um, and she is the director of the UNM Innovation Academy's Canopy for Creative Collaboration here at the Global Rainforest. Um, she brings her expertise in design-centered thinking, as well as systems thinking, um, which provides a powerful construct for critical and creative problem solving. Uh, before I turn it over to Nancy, let me just remind everybody, if you haven't signed in, in the back, please do that as you leave, uh, so we have a record. And this seminar is being recorded, and if you'd like to get credit for it in the University um, Center uh, Entrepreneurial Capability Certificate, uh, there would be a short assessment, which you can access at nmrainforest.com after the seminar. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Nancy. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Welcome, and thank you for the invitation. Um, today, we're going to have some fun in the next hour. Um, we're going to be um, doing a quick introduction, um, talking about some of the of, um, this overview of design thinking, some of why is it so popular these days, and kind of how it's so popular. Um, kind of we'll dive into the methodology of design thinking, and um, then design thinking is really best learned by doing. So we'll have a little hands-on um, activity, a couple of them actually, as we go. So um, to begin with myself, I. I I mentioned I am currently the director of the Canopy for Creative Collaboration. Come on in, everyone, if you're joining us. Um, we're just here at the um, rainforest that is, and I'm part of the Indiana Innovation Academy. Um, I was originally trained as a speech language pathologist um, and worked in that field for a long time. Returned to school. Um, around 2009 at MPA at UC Denver, and it was there really that I began um, diving into both systems thinking and design thinking, and uh, began a series of self-study and study at places like Stanford Design School, and um, was able to facilitate a maternal and child health grant um, that I had through um, Child Health Bureau, um, where we used uh, human-centered design and design thinking methodology. So that was really informative um, for all of us. And I'm an adjunct faculty at the School of Architecture and Planning, teaching design thinking. What we're aiming for today is to familiarize everyone. Obviously, in an hour, it's a it's a sampler, um, so it will hopefully pique your interest enough to dive deeper into it, um, which there are a lot of opportunities here and um, other places. <clears throat> so design thinking, it's a lot of things, lots of different definitions, but really it's an ideology or mindset that really keeps, um, puts humans or users at the center of any problem solving effort. Um, that's combined with a system of tools, processes, and this mindset to take you through strategic um, activities to lead you to a, a solution, a product, a system um, that actually meets the needs of the end user. So there's lots of different terminology that you can use, kind of depending on what sector you're in. Today, I'll, I may interchange like um, human-centered and end-user and user-centered, but um, they all basically mean keeping the person for whom you're designing or problem-solving at the center of your process. <clears throat> so, um, big secret, not really a secret, is that design thinking really doesn't, um, is not only about design. People talk about like the big D design and the little d design. Um, the Stanford Design School uh, logo is a small d, d period school, um, as opposed to individuals who are designers by um, very specific professional training. So design thinking is, um, you know, it, its name causes some problems, but um, you don't have to be a, a trained designer to apply the design thinking methodology. Um, so. Um, 
really it's about helping businesses, teams, individuals, you know, universities, nonprofits, health centers, um, think differently about strategic options and uh, systems impact. That's really kind of at its core what it is. This is a really um, nice summary article in the Harvard Business Review that came out last fall. Um, it's a great overview and it really focuses on um, the business application of design thinking. It's written by a woman at University of Virginia who um, is very involved in the Darden um, Center that does a lot of um, training. <coughs> And this is a list of just some of the kind of big name um, companies that use design thinking routinely. So I like to point this out to just give it a little credibility that um, although it may be a new-ish term, topic, concept, um, it's, it's uh, really embedded in a lot of companies. And there were some recent studies that looked at um, kind of growth for companies that quote like use design versus those that didn't and it's very impressive but they don't really define design very well so I'd like to go deep into that research but um, these companies feel like it's a worthwhile endeavor to give them an edge over their competitors. So um, Tim Brown is a fellow that started a company called IDEO um, based in Palo Alto about 30 years ago. Um, IDEO really popularized this design thinking term and uh, methodology. They used it originally for product design and they actually get credited with, um, or he gets credited with inventing the first mouse for Apple computers. You know, IBM a long time ago, I, the cursor was like a little annoying dot in the middle of a keyboard and um, and Brown thought about this uh, other piece, and I don't know why he called it a mouse. Somebody in here might know, but um, he's uh, stepping down as CEO in August of this year, but really has taken the IDEO and um, design thinking, really spread it. Um, he has worked with a fellow, with people from Stanford Design School, um, and they, um, the Stanford Design School uh, also popularizes the terminology and does quite a bit of training. <clears throat> so if you've seen anything about design thinking or human-centered design, the two terms are used somewhat interchangeably. Um, I won't say they're exact synonyms, but they're definitely used interchangeably. You may have seen this schematic, which has these five components of design thinking with various activities that go along with each one. Um, we're going to go into these in a little bit more detail, but before we do, I wanted to um, show you some other schematics that um, use some different vocabulary that helps, that might help understand some of what these components are. But this is a um, another just note to the popularity of design thinking that a four-day boot camp um, from Insights to Innovation at the Executive Education branch of Stanford Business School um, is a near $12,600, <laughs> not including report. Um, so it's, um, it's kind of big business in a lot of places, and we're happy here at UNM with the STC, the Innovation Academy, the Rainforest, our work with Sandia and AFRL and other partners in the community to be bringing this useful methodology to the Mexicans. So um, one, I like all of these different schematics for different reasons. I'm not going to go into each one in great detail, but you can see that um, you start by framing a question, you, you do some what Stanford calls empathy field work, which is really finding out what your um, customer, beneficiary, end user really needs instead of what you think they need. Um, just have a period of generating ideas, <laughs> make ideas tangible through this low resolution prototyping. Um, then you test to learn things about your proposed solutions 
and finally, um, you know, you're ready to launch something. Uh, here's another schematic which really illustrates that this isn't a straight line, even though these schematics are linear. It's a dynamic process, as you might guess. Um, and they also insert this idea of the point of view. So through all of this, what they call empathy field work, you construct these points of view of your end user and kind of design off of that. And this one is a schematic that a company in um, Chicago uses. Um, they're called Greater Good Studio. Um, they're for profit and business to um, really apply this methodology for um, for the nonprofit sector and for a kind of a social impact sector. The, um, it's, it was started by a husband and wife, and the husband was at IEO for a long time, and he has a description of this conflict where he was um, perhaps designing a Kool-Aid package in the morning and um, solutions for childhood diabetes in the afternoon and that that uh, tension got him to leave IDEO and start this company that really brings this methodology specifically to um, social issues and um, IDEO.com uh, you know IDEO the the product design company started about 30 years ago. Um, I think about seven years ago, started a, brand, a nonprofit branch called IDEO.org, and they're doing the same thing where they're bringing this way of approaching really complex issues, um, this methodology to really complex issues, primarily in other countries, um, but they're, they, they're doing a lot of good as well. And finally, this is pretty hard to read, but I like that this is kind of circular and also shows this back and forth nature. I mean, most of you know that any process that's allegedly linear really isn't because it's always good to um, get feedback and iterate when you need to. So um, there's you know, different definitions, different ways of um, talking about this process, but there are some similarities as well. Basically, it, it relies on a creative and collaborative um, problem-solving process. So it's not about getting you and the people you work with all the time and only those people in a room together to solve a problem, but really kind of branching out and bringing diverse thinkers into the mix. Um, <laughs> the tools and processes rely on this diverse collaboration while addressing these really complex issues that are really impossible to um, address in an individual way. Um, I mean, think in the social sector, think of the big um, intractable challenges, poverty, um, homelessness, education system, healthcare. Um, so design thinking really isn't a new thing. It's really kind of garnered these um, tools and processes from many different areas and combine them in perhaps a new systematic way. And by incorporating this, um, this component of low resolution or soft, resolu soft prototyping, where you do mock-ups of your ideas in a quick kind of way and get feedback, you can kind of make tangible your ideas, get feedback on it, and actually iterate before you go to the bank with it so that you're not um, solving some, you're not um, what do they say? Um, technology looking for a problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. It, it keeps this human-centered design framework so that you, you develop a mindset in terms of approaching problems so that even if you're not on a team saying, okay, we need to address X, that it, um, the think the belief is that the more as an organization or system or team, the more everyone kind of adopts this way of thinking, the more it influences your thinking process before you even get to the table. There's a, um, a company, the Tide Foundation, which I think is in Palo Alto area as well, and they um, went through, I think, four CEOs in four years and then had a new person come in who's but, um, she wrote an article that was published in the 
expert um, review of innovation, I think. And where she came in and, um, you know, it was a foundation, so they were depending on investments to have more money to um, give. And things weren't going so well after four CEOs in four years. And she decided to do this top down, bottom up design thinking um, right out of the gate. So the board and her top leadership team got some intensive training, all the current staff and every new hire was introduced to this way of thinking and they got great results you know, as a result of it. I'm sure it wasn't just that, but she really is a proponent of kind of this mind sync in terms of this methodology. So all this talk about um, design thinking, um, what is it really? Here's a little like four minute video that's a pretty good example. We're going to do um, a really quick thing, as I mentioned. So, um, take a couple of um, and um, and then um, everybody gets them. We're going to implement this like rapid thinking thing. We're going to have like. Um, we have this. We're going to take um, like 45 seconds to draw a vase, a flower vase. So for, imagine you're a florist and you want vases that really um, are nice for your beautiful flower arrangement. So don't start yet. Draw the vase back. And so on the orange, <coughs> draw a vase. Orange post it. Let's draw a base Whoops. quickly. Anybody have orange post it? Ten more seconds. Everybody's done with your base. Um, now, everybody have a purple post-it? Like a purple post-it? Yeah, so put that one aside. And this time, you're going to design a way for people to enjoy flowers in their home and dry. All right? So, might be base, might be something else. But the, the problem frame is this draw something to allow people to enjoy flowers in their home. 60 seconds. <laughs> People are giving me really darting looks. <laughs> Thirty more seconds. We'll take about ten more seconds and wrap it up. All right, 
Um, since we're the size that we are, I'm not, and since we only have an hour, I'm not going to have you partner up and share, but I'll ask for um, brave people who want to kind of share their two different looks staring at the front row. Come your name again. Andrew. Andrew. You want to share what you did? <laughs> sure. So in terms of flower vase, I was thinking about um, pretty much the only two innovations I've got here. I was, I was, I was really trying to think about it was um, a lot of vases I've noticed aren't necessarily easy to carry, especially if they've been outside for a while, so they might be smudged with dirt or some other stuff on it. So I put two hand handles on it because I like symmetry. I think that's important. And then I put the little sun with the beams of light going through to indicate that it's translucent so you can see what's inside. Nice. Very good. And then your way for people to experience. So I was actually just thinking about this because I saw, um, I was in a friend's home and I saw that they had flowers displayed like up above their kitchen cabinets. And I really liked the use of that. I'm not negative space is the right word, yeah. but that space that normally goes unused, uh -huh. they're like beautifying it. Uh -huh. The only issue being that if you were to put real flowers <laughs> there, which we're going to assume you, which we're going to assume you are, even though I probably wouldn't. Uh -huh. <laughs> but um, what I realized is that it's kind of unless you're a tall guy like me, it's kind of an inconvenience to <laughs> get uh, to take give that those flowers the attention that they deserve. Right. So I mocked up. <laughs> More or less, like a pull, like a hypothetical pulley system, so you could raise or lower it, so I can right. water them, take them out of the sun, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's great. <laughs> so, a location, a, a unique location to enjoy fresh flowers and a system for making natural. Yes. Nice. Thank you for sharing. Someone else. Um, so. My first design is um, I always listen to music in the morning. It sort of gets me going, so it hypes me up for the day. And um, I thought, why not make it more feng shui and put a stereo in my face? So that, way, so that way I can enjoy flowers while I'm listening to music. And it could be a cool, easy implementation. And my next thing is since I love music so much, um, the, you know how at Times Square for New Year's Eve, all the confetti falls everywhere? I thought if I had attached like a latch to my ceiling and I'd fold it, rose petals would fall down. <laughs> oh, and, and the innovative the first ones are as well. One more? I also had the idea of putting a handle on the base, apparently, so that she, so, <laughs> so like putting a handle on the base, you can easily carry it in a heated too. So I guess that's like a common thing that everybody gets, like yes. <laughs> handles on bases. And for um, displaying it, or I guess enjoying it, I had like this glass box that opens from the bottom and it has a light on the top and it has holes on the top as well. So the plant you can breathe and the light is controlled by a switch that you can turn on or off. And then put the base inside and cover it with the glass box, and it can be like a little pretty presentation oh, of nice. the show. Great. Nice. Anyone that? So, this is a simple, quick um, little exercise to show that how you frame a problem can really direct your the way you think about it. Um, and reframing, framing and reframing problems and making sure you're actually going after the right issue is a really big part of design thinking. In my mind, it's almost the jewel of it. Because I've spent a lot of time in the nonprofit world and um, a lot of times you're, you know, you're charged with some, a really big issue that most people are very passionate about. Um, maybe there's a grant opportunity, you write, you know, you write the proposals, you're lucky enough to get Funded, then you um, you go after you know enable and implementing your proposal, um, which may or may not ever have really listened to the end beneficiaries of the issue, um, and then you design you come up with something and it either does or doesn't hit the mark. If it doesn't hit the mark, it may very well be because you didn't like um, rub shoulders with the people for whom you were problem solving. And I usually say, you know, you end up with a storage room full of beautifully designed products <laughs> that don't hit the mark um, because perhaps the reading level is too high or they're too, too much information for the 
maybe they're designed for docs, but it's too much information for the time span that they have to use the product or whatever. So this, um, I think we, we're all, we're all uh, made to really try to go to solutions fast, but this, problem, this process makes you put the brakes on uh, that solution piece until you go through all the processes and really ensure that you are going after the right problem. So I don't know if others have had that situation where you, you actually missed the mark because it kind of missed the, the issue. Um, so I'm going to very quickly go through um, definitions of the, of the five components that Stanford uses. Others use seven. You saw how many different kinds of schematics, but they're all basically getting at the same thing. Um, empathy is really considered this foundation of design thinking. And um, it's, you know, we're, real, we're rarely able to solve problems on our own. And um, if there are particular users or beneficiaries, we have to build empathy by, by learning what's important to them. And this is usually done through observation, engagement, um, like interviewing, and immersion. Um, that's sort of the quick description. Um, other people talk about empathy as contextualizing the problem, really understanding the context in which the, the um, problem exists. <clears throat> Defining is the mode that um, really expresses the problem that you're trying to address. And in order to be really generative, you must reframe the challenge based on your new insights gained through your empathy fieldwork. So say you want to solve, um, you want parents to um, be inspired to read to their children, um, but imagine that through your empathy field work, you learned that um, parents are reading to their children. The, the issue is having trouble getting a hold of books that are appropriate. So instead of aiming at a marketing um, program that would try to make parents want to read to their children, your solution might go after how to get books in the hands of parents more easily. That's just an example. <laughs> The next, um, ideate is a word that um, I swear Stanford must have invented. <laughs> I think it gets a red squiggly line on word. Um, but basically it's brainstorming, but it's brainstorming in, um, you know, with all the similar um, rules of brainstorming. Don't say, don't negate somebody's, um, don't say yes, but, say yes, and. Really try to make it as generative as possible. And also, um, invite these kind of wild, wild extremes of ideas. So um, it's this very divergent um, process where um, more is better. So you're going after quantity, not quality in this process. And then prototyping is really where you get the ideas out of your head and into the world. And a prototype can take various forms. It could be, you know, something, um, a wall full of post-its, a role play, an object, um, these low resolution prototyping, which we have um, in the, the space that, that's the canopy for creative collaboration in the lobby here. We ha now have um, bins of low resolution prototyping supplies. Um, they're inexpensive, you can learn quickly, you can iterate and explore possibilities um, in a fast kind of way. And I think, um, a lot of times this step of prototyping for people who mainly have been um, uh, like I heard somebody say, you know, the most thing these hands have done has typed on a keyboard. You, know, you don't consider yourself a maker. Sometimes prototyping is like, oh, like it's bad enough to draw on a post-it, but now you want me to try to make something. But um, it's really good to think about prototyping as a way of getting feedback on various aspects of the solution. You're not going after this scalable model that you want to get feedback on. You're, you're prototyping various aspects. Um, we have more time and, you know, perhaps in the future we can do things where we'll really have time to get our hands dirty and, or active and um, do some of this. So it makes a little bit more sense, but hopefully this is making some sense. Um, and then this test phase, which is very cyclical. So you, you take your low resolution prototypes into the context of the user's life. 
or you know the person on the street if you can't actually get to the exact user and you get feedback about it um, and then you go come back as a team and kind of iterate based on that feedback so it's really easy it's so much easier to think about prototype designing and prototyping a product especially almost every time I do workshops um, when we get to the ideating and prototyping pretty much every team has an app because it's really easy to go there. Um, it's an easy thing to prototype, it's easy to think about that as a solution. But you actually can use this process, prototype and test um, service solutions or system solutions, um, which those all those big companies, they're not using this just from a product point of view, they're using it internally for their systems functioning as well. <laughs> so just one word on um, empathy, because um, a lot of there's a lot of talk in the field about the use of that word empathy. But in April of this year, the Santa Fe Institute Parallax um, newsletter came out with this article of, on empathy. Um, I have the reference if anybody wants it, um, where they studied the origins of empathy, and um, they found that the very origin of empathy may lie in the need to understand. The need to understand individuals from an um, evolutionary point of view. So, um, this this interest in understanding your how, who you are and how you function is um, built in, and it's a they they have asserted that it's a cognitive process. Um, so there also are a few kind of personal design behaviors and attitudes that are talked about. This idea of being really curious, you come to the table assuming that you don't have the solution, which is different for a lot of us um, and different as a team. Um, you saw the mention of um, how might we questions, which are big in this design thinking. And so you, you do your empathy field work and then you, um, you try to um, figure out the problem. And rather than saying, how can we? say how might we um, how might we get books into the hands of parents more easily um, instead of here's the solution that's going on. <laughs> it's just a, it's a semantic thing that I think I, I, I think it's a refreshing how might we because it really implies that nobody in the room has the absolute solution at that moment and they all have to stay open to learning which I have to find refreshing um, this idea of navigating ambiguity. Um, sometimes I'll ask groups like, who, who likes ambiguity? And usually maybe one person will raise their hand. I feel like I, I, I am very familiar with ambiguity in life, but um, I wouldn't say that I like, love it and, and invite it in. But I have also heard it said that the, a, a skill, a work skill for this upcoming generation is this, I, this ability to navigate ambiguity because um, you know everything changes and there's um, being able to speak clearly when the path isn't clear is a really good trait. Um, oh, let's, let's, uh, show unfinished work which is what you had an example of with this quick little post-it drawing exercise. Um, not so easy when you're in a room of your peers or, you know, peers and um, superiors, perhaps. And then making ideas visible. So um, drawing is pretty darn uncomfortable for me. I'd much rather write something. Um, but it's really, it is really good. It's a really good exercise to um, make visible your idea in a way other than writing. Um, opens it up in ways that I wouldn't have the belief in myself and I resist it because I'm really bad at drawing. Um, so this, I'm sorry that this is so small, but um, this, this kind of a summary statement. So the, the structure of design thinking creates this natural flow from research, which it really is a research methodology, to roll out. <coughs> the, you, you know, immersion in the customer experience produces data, which transforms into insights of the, what I'm calling the design team, which helps teams agree on design criteria they use to brainstorm solutions. So back to the little video, 
um, they might have had assumptions about kids wanting to listen to music or what's going to motivate them to exercise. But what they found really was it was the social sharing with their peers that was key. Um, so that's kind of um, agreeing on design criteria that you learn from your um, empathy field work. And then assumptions about what's critical to the success of those solutions are really examined. So you kind of get your assumptions out of the way. And tested with rough prototypes to help teams further develop innovations and prepare them for real world experiments. So in a nutshell, that's kind of what all these five processes do. Um, I've been talking really fast because we only have an hour, but any question, I'll, I'll, I'll pause for a minute. Not yet done. We just keep going and we'll hold questions. Okay. <clears throat> um, so here's a little, um, this is uh, actually a, a commercial from the Super Bowl, which one of the um, mottos in design thinking is fail forward. So learn, you know, like don't consider a fail, a loss, a failure, a bad thing, because, you, you know, this rapid iteration Low resolution and rapid iterations means that you can have a lot of quote failures so that you can actually design um, for success. Um, so here's a really cute commercial about um, failing forward. Fail forward <laughs> sometimes. Um, let's see. So I found this quote um, that hopefully Albert Einstein really said, um, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about the solution. And I think as a, as a nature, we typically kind of reverse that. So design thinking forces you to really dig into the problem before you move towards the solution. And here's an example. Um, of problem reframing that was um, apparently first um, first discussed in 1960, though I didn't know we had <coughs> sanitizers in 1960, but there was a problem of the um, elevator being too slow, and so the solution finding came to like make the elevator faster, install a new lift, upgrade the motor, improve the algorithm, um, big expense. And then they reframed the problem to um, the weight is annoying for people. So it wasn't so much that elevators needed to be faster, but how can you make the weight less annoying? And they found that um, if they did things like put mirrors up, play music, install a hand sanitizer, give people something to do in those few seconds that they're waiting, then they feel less, um, then they're less bothered by waiting. They don't notice it so much. I've also read something about um, airport design um, <coughs> with um, baggage claim, like how irritating it is to wait for your baggage. So as they design new airports, um, they put baggage claim farther away from the gates so that you, it takes you longer to get there. So you're walking instead of waiting. Um, so it seems like you finally get there. I always say DIA is like an athletic event. You know, by the time you get to baggage claim, you're like, it's here, <laughs> but it actually was you know, maybe 20 minutes by the time you got off the plane. Um, so, like I mentioned, the best way to learn about design thinking is to do it. And we are just almost out of time, but I wanted to leave you guys with something. Um, this, uh, <coughs> uh, idea dashboard. Um, that actually um, you can you can use this on your own because I'm guessing that most people in this room have ideas swirling or a lot of ideas swirling around their head. So you can use this to like flesh out what the um, what's the solution you're thinking about. Um, what is it? What kind of change does it create for people? Why is it an, an effective step? towards the near star, and who or how um, would it be implemented, and how could it be created in the system, and then a little space to draw it. And I, I just would invite you guys to do this on your own time sometime this week. And then on the back, it's not on here, but on the back, I would, in order to kind of take the first step into design thinking, I would 
invite you to think about um, your empathy field work, your research. If you were going to take step one and try to really understand the end user, the beneficiary, your customer, whatever term you want to use, um, where would who would you like to talk to? What kind of secondary research would you want to gather? Um, who would you want to interview? Where would you ideally like to immerse yourself to learn more about the problem? Where could you observe things kind of anonymously? So just kind of map out a beginning um, research plan using this methodology. And um, we won't come back together as a group, but um, I have my, let's see, I'm happy to um, respond in the future and we'll be doing more things like this and, and more in more depth through the Innovation Academy and partnering with STCDM and the Rainforest and um, so any questions? types of methodologies and never really realized that by things like the uh, lean startup methodology, uh, second semi you know, we really built a lot of, that was always in here, but I never put all that together. So it's very interesting that there's parallels. Yes, there are total parallels. That's mm -hmm. a really good point. Yes. STC, is that what you're, what is that? What's that? There's some of those that are, oh yeah, we're at, uh, an organization group owned by the university commercializing the research at UNM <coughs> and seeking a technical distance for science and technology corporation. Thank you. Well, we shortened it so you don't use that full minute anymore. Because <laughs> I'm like sitting here thinking, what is that? <laughs> is this similar to um, the way we use the, like improvement science? This so, like improvement science? Like quality improvement? Well, yeah, I mean, like in education, when we're trying to tackle an issue, we use improvement science. It's kind of similar, but um, I feel like, because I would like to use this way of solving problems in school or right. to the staff. Yes, it, which there are um, lots of people doing that, and I could send you some references for that. Um, it is what we, uh, I did quality for a time in health care for uh -huh. um, and Yeah, that's it. Similar but different. In other words, I mean, you, you try to problem solve what it is. You spend a lot of time on the problem and yeah. then like and like really picking apart the problem as a team. And but it's it's very similar. But yeah, um, I'm not a quality improvement specialist, but I have some experience with it. And I think part of the difference is um, I've seen it done where you where that diving into the problem isn't so much a part of it. You sort of start with the problem and go from there. Mm -hmm. um, but also this idea of this like rapid iteration. So like let's see if our solution, let's, let's do a low run version of a solution and get some immediate feedback. And um, I mean, I know the plan do. <coughs> yeah. So it's not, um, it's not, uh, divorced from that by any means, but it is, it's, it provides a few different things, but definitely used in tandem in a lot of places. Yeah. But you can't go too far out like in healthcare or education because of the nature of the beast. You have a sort of schematic. But I like this method of you because I feel like in the science, there's not a whole lot of like testing. Right. So you say like second for so long right. that you're not really testing solutions yes. and then coming back. Right. That's how kind of how I've seen it. Like if you hit the mark to begin with, maybe you'll get some quality improvement, but if you don't actually hit the mark, but you're off to the races. Mm -hmm. um, right. And it's a learning process. I mean this it's it sounds it might sound easy, but it's really not that easy because 
um, it's it's because we're humans. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just challenging. One last question. Um, I felt like trying to go through this process and like actually implementing it. Um, it was almost sort of like a defined stage before the emphasize to try to, or I guess, what would you call that? Like when you're trying to um, identify, I guess, the problem or whatever it is. And then I know you like empathize. I was kind of struggling with that initial part. It's like, well, which one comes first? Is it yeah. define, empathize, define, or? Yeah, it's kind of define or sort of state, empathize, re redefine. Um, I can use two I might think that you have this problem, but you may not think you have that problem. And that's, I guess, where I think the emphasize is, is figuring out. Yeah. How does the other person define the problem? Right. Yeah. Maybe not, if they're not going to change if they don't see it. Right. <laughs> Maybe it's not the problem that I think it is. <laughs> yes. Right. Do you have a project you work on where you put it all in together? Can you describe that to Yeah, so um, the Montreal and Child Health Project, and we are over time by five minutes. Is that right? If people need to leave, feel yeah. free to do so. Um, so the, the grant um, charged us with a very um, broad, vague charge, which was to improve the developmental monitoring of um, a child's of a child's development on the part of parents. So improve the parents, um, you know, ability, willingness to de developmentally monitor their child's development. Lots of big issues there, you know, like um, and assumptions that parents aren't doing that already. So what we did, and I we I worked with um, T J Cook, and we really dug into. Um, we kind of tore that problem statement apart and realized that um, engaging parents was really key to whatever we were going to come up with. So we took some time as a team to look at what engaged us, what was engaging for us. So we, you know, that was put some time and then what are kind of qualities of engagement, what makes you want to engage in something, what makes you not want to engage. And then we, um, I'm doing a short version of this, we did our, our empathy field work through observations and interviews, mainly with parents of young kids um, who happen to have had developmental delays or hearing loss or something like that. And what we discovered through that was that all of them, all, and not that we didn't interview 100 people, we interviewed I think maybe 12, um, so small scale, but 100% um, of them found the resource that they needed, not through their pediatrician, not through the internet, not through these, not through any kind of promotional CDC information. They found it through um, what I'm calling a social network, but not, not Facebook. So um, my mother's coworker's daughter, um, the neighbor's cousin, my sister-in-law's brother, um, it was all through that, not, not just familial, but um, it was that aspect. And so we realized so we, that came out and also that in, as a system, the right hand really does not know what the left hand is doing, and the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing. So there, it wasn't, if we had just gone about how can we help parent, engage parents in monitoring their child's development, we probably would have gone down a product line um, or a service line, but we found that there weren't, what the business problem was not a lack of service, was that like, you know, nobody was knew who to talk to, and that these formalized mechanisms were really not the main way that people got the resources that they needed. So then we went on from there to, um, I won't, I won't those were our insights, and we, we got an extension on the grant and kind of went on from there that I could go into with you after we break up. But um, I know that we would have come up with a product if we had just said, how can we get parents to, you know, let's give them a little, let, let's do an app, let's do something. And really, um, that, wasn't, that wasn't really the big issue. So.
Well, thank you guys so much for your attention. I really appreciate it.